three. Facing Hope. Learn more right after this. If you're looking for a new pet that your family will cherish every day, consider adopting from a shelter. Shelters are the best places to find a new pet. That's where you'll discover healthy, loyal, and loving animals eager to become a part of your family. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. So bring home your new buddy today. To find out more, visit the shelterpetproject.org. Welcome to Community Watch. Greg. Doug. How you doing? How okay. you doing, bro? All right, all right. You're throwing one at me now. Yeah, we got hope. <laughs> <laughs> Facing hope now. We got to take it up a level. Uh, um, well, uh, Facing Hope is a publication that came mm -hmm. out fairly recently uh, with stories of um, individuals who have overcome situations and have... have uh, uh, come out with hope. We're going to uh, talk a little bit with one of the writers who helped put this together. Okay. And um, our guest, Oliver Robbins, is actually into a lot of different things. So I just thought, you know, we need to have a conversation with this man. Have a conversation with Oliver. Yeah. So uh, Facing Hope is one of the subjects. Many we're, programs. But, we're going uh, to cover a number, number of things, all of them dealing with the uh, community efforts and so my kind of shit I know I know I figured you'd be excited so stay with us we'll be right back with our guest after this should be a, a really good show stay tuned looking for these you drive buzzed it could be one very expensive ride First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to Community Watch, and we're very pleased to have with us today Oliver Robbins. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, when I thought about having you on, what really surprised me is that why haven't we had Oliver on here before? Because uh, you should have been, and that's right. that's that's my. I'll take I'll take the hit on that. That's my. Yeah, that's yours. That's mine. That's mine. <laughs> you got to wear that one. <laughs> well, um, let's talk a little bit about the Facing Hope Project. Yes, sir. Um, and I've got about, I don't know, 500 of these in my office right now, so I know they're available. They haven't right. been out that long, no, late sir. fall. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about what it is. Facing Hope was a project that was started uh, by this guy's name is Kelsey Zimmerman. And he first started a project on his own, and it was called Where Am I Wearing? And what he did was he went and found all of his clothes and looked at the tags in the back of it to find out where these clothes were made. And he went to these different places to try and, you know, highlight some of the working conditions of folks that make the things that we consume here in the United States. And he wanted to break that whole project down to a more local level. So he started a pilot program with local universities in and around his area, and it has now moved into our area. And it was to highlight some of the things that never get highlighted, like nonprofit organizations and the work that they do, and the people that are directly affected by those services. I was asked by Miss Juliana Bright Hop. Bright Hop, yeah. They, I call her Miss B. B. <laughs> yeah, Miss B. <laughs> B. I was asked by um, her and uh, also Professor Bishop, Jesse Bishop, who mm -hmm. is a professor at Georgia Hollins while I was taking classes there to participate in the program. And my initial project was with uh, the Open Door Home here in, in Floyd County. And what we did was we actually went in and interviewed a person that had received services from the Open Door Home. And in, in my case, it was a young lady who is now of, of age to mm -hmm. not be in the Open Door Home and has since gone on to enroll in college 
and is set to graduate in about a year. And she actually got to tell her story to me, mm. and I in turn put it into a, a, a story, a narrative that could be put into the book. So it gave not only myself, but it gave the person that was telling the story an outlet. It gave the organization that was providing services some some exposure so that they could hopefully you know mm -hmm. secure more mm -hmm. funding and things like that and it also helped literally change my life dramatically just seeing this whole process happen from top to bottom well um as far as the open door home mm -hmm. um had you known anything about them before you and what was your History. Yes, there. sir. I, uh, I worked as a uh, jailer at the local youth detention center uh -huh. for four years. And after that, I moved into community corrections as a probation officer. And I did that for six years. So, uh, well, I'm seven or eight years. I'm sorry. Maybe about 11 to 12 years total. And I did that and, and got to know a lot of the people in the non nonprofit organizations here in, the, in and around town. I got to know uh, Mr. Shropshire, of course, from the Transitional Academy. Mm -hmm. And I got to know a lot of other people that work with at-risk youth. But uh, this is what was so cool about Face and Hope is it wasn't just at-risk youth that was highlighted. It was every nonprofit organization that served people that just really had needs. And it really opened my eyes to the amount of work folks around this town do to make sure we, we give a helping hand when that's needed. Now, if you said it dramatically changed your life, how, how was that? How, how did the project change your life? Well, I, like I said before, I worked for the Department of Juvenile Justice. and. Uh, I got, I love the work. I met some amazing people mm -hmm. and I was able to reach some people, but for the most part, I will leave work kind of drained sometimes because it's, it's work that, of course, you want to help everybody, but everyone can't be helped. And that took a toll on me and I wanted to switch directions. So when I left there, I went to school to go into the medical field. And since doing this project, I've had many doors open for me that allowed me to do some something that I've loved to do since I was a little kid, which is right and uh, express myself through writing or through any type of, of artistic, you know, thing that anything that you can offer artistically to do. I love to be able to reach people through that and try to change people through that. And that in a sense gives folks a, a chance to find you instead of you having to go out and try and change them when they don't really want to be changed. So, so it helped you see what might be the ultimate direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm still kind of feeling that out a little bit. Um, well, that's all right. We're, I'm with, I'm we're still doing no, that. No, no, no. I'm, still, I'm, I'm seeing the book. I'm seeing the book coming down the line somewhere. I mean, but that's great because listening to you and watching you, I can mm -hmm. sense and feel your passion. Right. And I truly believe that one of the problems with at-risk youth is that they haven't really found their passion. Mm -hmm. Because I think once you're working in your passion, it, it just consumes you because you love what you're doing. Right. And I just think so many youth haven't had that opportunity to truly find what it is they enjoy. Right. And so then they just get dragged off into these other areas. But I'm, I'm glad that you found right. what it is, your passion, because I truly believe once you find it, then it just changes everything. It really It does. just really changes your motivation. It changes what you're engaged in. And so that, that's great to hear, brother. That's really right. great. Right. I. I noticed that the stories in the publication don't identify by name right. any of the subjects. Right. And I assume that was something that was intentional about it up front. Yes, sir. Uh, and what was the reason for that? Uh, the reason was they wanted it to be anonymous because some of the people that, you know, had services from different organizations, there may be some sensitive issues that were talked about such as a sexual assault center was uh, I think one of the people that participated in, in, the, in the whole project. And those are stories I think that, you know, you can put a face of anyone that you know in the community in that spot and still be able to, to get the gist of what these folks do at the sexual assault center every day to help those that come to them needing help. And I, it was important for us to also be able to have the people we spoke with be comfortable about it because there were you know papers that they had to sign releasing you know the material and opened a home or the sexual assault center or the foundation camp they all had to agree that these stories would be published and they would be used by facing hope and and so it was a it was a huge thing about you know making sure that everyone involved mm -hmm. with the project was comfortable and that's kind of why we left names out yeah yeah, yeah. So. well that makes sense so you wrote like um, 
20 or 30 the articles no. in here? No? No, no I, I wrote a couple. <laughs> oh, okay. All yeah, right. I wrote one about the open door home, and uh, Miss Greta Wilson was the uh, point person for that, and she yeah. is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, and what was really unique about that particular story that I wrote was it was almost like uh, the child was looking in a mirror mm -hmm. and able to see themselves for who they were and see how far they had become. Mm. when normally you don't really think about those things when you're in a situation, but the fact that you could look at a situation you were in and see how far you've moved away from it. And she told that story sitting right in front of the people that were right, directly responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So it was really neat to see that dynamic and there was some, some tears shed and some hugs exchanged, but I think all in all, just the, the simple fact that they were being recognized for the work they did was reward enough for the Open Door Home. Now, now that's interesting because you're saying that the act of telling the story mm -hmm. made the, the, the person kind of understand things in a way that they hadn't before. Absolutely. Uh, that's interesting, because that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, we found that to be true when we were doing Writers Academy mm -hmm. sometimes. We would get some, uh, some writing that opened up the way people saw themselves. So. Exactly. You know what I'm thinking, um, listening to Oliver speak about this, is that one, one of the downfalls or one of the sad points of a lot of nonprofit organizations is that you, re you never really get to reap your harvest mm -hmm. of what you plant. You do good work, you try to help people, and a lot of times it's what you do and coupled with other things that makes the difference. But you don't never really get to see that a lot of times because it's a process. And so, you know, I always use the analogy, you know, we're, we're gardeners. We plant a seed and we hope all this other stuff are happening to grow. But so um, this is really great in the sense that because a lot of nonprofits, you may get funding, you may get other things, but the reward from the people you actually helped, right, which means the most, you very seldom really get that, you right. know. And so, I mean, to have this where these organizations are receiving that kind of recognition from somebody, that they served, right. I think is, uh, is priceless, it's right. priceless. I think there were several students that wrote for this particular project that ended up changing their major. Mm. You know, really? Some, some going into social services, some going into more journalism, you know, type fields, and it just, all the way around, it was an absolutely wonderful mm. experience for everyone that was involved. And I, I should probably mention that in addition to participants from Georgia Highlands, there were participants from Berry College. Berry College, and Georgia, Georgia Northwestern. Northwestern. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so what was, what was the other one you wrote? Uh, the other one was about the foundation camp, oh, which I'm sure you guys are familiar <laughs> with that. <laughs> and that one was really special as well. Um, the young man that I interviewed, um, he was brought to me by Professor Bishop, who was uh, my mentor throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that this is a story that needed to be told. And of course, you guys are directly involved with making sure that that program continues mm -hmm. to work. But this young man's story, the reason why it was so important that this story was told is because he is still, today, assisting with the foundation camp. Okay. So the things that he's done and he's learned from coming to that camp, even when it was at the NYSP, when it was that camp, he would go and now it's changed to the foundation camp because mm -hmm. of some things that happened, but he's still, he's so passionate about what he learned there. He continues to do good work with those children down at uh, the camp every summer. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really a unique aspect that could be you know, shown through telling this particular story is this person not only benefited, but now they're back giving back some of the things that they got from the program. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was a really awesome story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one of those, I remember one of the videos, uh, David is talking about, you know, we paying it forward and that with stuff like the camp, you know, you're gonna pay one or two ways. You know, these kids gonna be leaders in the community or they're gonna be on the other spectrum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's one of those things where, you know, you just never know what really happens to everybody and so you know you just have to keep doing going what with, with faith but when you was listening to these stories Oliver and, and, and your colleagues did it was it did it just kind of hit you like you knew about all these organizations but the true impact 
did it, did it just kind of hit you like, wow, this is, I didn't realize the, the impact that some of these programs really had. It really did. I, uh, like I said, I worked in it for years. So I was familiar with all these people and I mm -hmm. knew that they worked their fingers to the bone every single day. And to see it and to hear someone tell, because those are stories that you normally don't get to hear, especially when you're on the other side of the desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, you always get the shut ups and I hate you and I hope mm -hmm. you'll die. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you never I, I got that today. <laughs> but when these people get better, they usually go on and they become, you know, upstanding adults. And very rarely do you pass across again where you can get to hear that story. And I think it was just it really touched me in a special place because I remember those those kids, you know, that I worked with and I would see them in the community and they would say, hey, Mr. Robbins, you know, you really changed my life. You really made a difference to me. And to put that in something that's, you know, like a magazine that people can read over and over again, it's, it's so great for these folks that work at these nonprofits to be able to to get that exposure that they, they really, really deserve. You know? Well, we're coming up on a, a break here, but we'll be back shortly with a lot more, so please stay with us. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to Community Watch. We're having a conversation with Oliver Robbins, who is one of the writers in the publication Facing Hope. And um, I don't, Oliver, I don't know what you were writing, your history as a writer is, mm -hmm. but you're good. Um, because these are, uh, it's not just what the stories are about, but it's how they're told. Right. And um, you, you really captured those stories. Right. So uh, well, thank you. I don't know, I don't know your writing history or, um, but uh, but uh, I hope you are sticking with this. I, I am. I actually, I, uh, I, I used to write as a kid, and uh, I was in a program. They called it Challenge back then. I don't know what they call it now. Mm. It was a gifted program. And uh, Miss Sue Lee, who recently oh, ran yes, for office, uh -huh. she asked me to come down to a place called the Green Glass Trading Company that was on Broad Street. And this is when I was in the second grade. I may be telling a little bit of my age right now. Yeah. But, I actually read a, a story that I wrote in the second grade there, and that's where the love kind of was born for it. You know, just you know, presenting ideas that people have to listen to. And I think what's unique yeah. about writing is it's not a really a conversation. It's not I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next. At that point in time, if someone's reading your work, they have to listen to what you say. You know, and it's it's mm. an art mm. that I think is being lost in technology and texting. You know, and I think there's something that we really need to get back to as, as society is, is reading and writing and just those things that have, have helped me to grow into yeah. a better writer. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear that? I did. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> I, I did. I'm multitasking. <laughs> multitasking. I, um, I was just uh, digging at you because you're so pro-technology. So I'm sorry. I mean, technology has its place. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It has its know. place. You know, know what I'm saying? I'm quite sure some technology <laughs> made all this possible. I know. Just so I say this, there is a voice on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. Um, well, technology, it, well, I don't always want to talk to people. So, I mean, technology helps in that. But, you know, but, um, Oliver, you know, when I think, when you, when you talk about that, I mean, there's a point in that we were just speaking that something kind of hit me that, and I, and I think for me, this happens too many, too many times to students, but specifically African-American students. Mm -hmm. You enjoyed something, you had something you enjoyed, mm -hmm. which was writing when you were young. And so the question becomes to me, so what happened? And I think a lot mm -hmm. of times for especially young African-American males, mm -hmm. we're so pigeonholed and limited to the way we can express ourselves mm -hmm. that let's be honest, when you start talking about the performing arts or writing, you know, you can get ridiculed and bullied, you right. know, because that's something we don't do. But that's, 
But that's sad in that sense that we don't have enough opportunities for young men and women, but specifically African-American young men and women to explore those avenues right. of arts. That the art is here just as much as basketball or football. Right. But we're not, as, I don't feel that they are encouraged nearly as much right. to participate in those type of endeavors. And so when you said it, it kind of struck a chord with me because I know in the Writers Academy, which I'm not a writer, right. but in working with Writers Academy with Doc, you know, you will see students, you will always have these a handful of students that were good. I mean, it was, and you read their writing and you're like, wow, that's very descriptive. And you look at the student and it was just, you didn't see that. Right. But then when they actually wrote, it's like, wow. And so it made, just when you said it, it just made me go back to, you know, we have to do something as a community to make sure that we provide right. writing and those type of artistic abilities, uh, opportunities for students. Because clearly you found yours again. Well, I, I was blessed in the sense that I had a mother and a father that both uh, nurtured whatever I wanted to do. You know, and I, I played basketball, I was in a band, but they told me you can follow your own path and that's okay. It doesn't matter what Johnny says or Martin says, you can do what you want to do and you can feel good about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that whole process starts, mm -hmm. is it starts with, you know, parents and loved ones telling their children, you can do what you want to do. You don't have to, to fit a certain mold. You don't have to be what people expect you to be. Mm -hmm. You can be what you want to be. Mm -hmm. And I was just fortunate and blessed enough to have my mother and my father, Oliver and Deborah, who, who actually nurtured that, that sense in me and gave me that strength to be able to stand up to situations where you may have been picked on or ridiculed for what you love to do. So. And my understanding is that um, your writing's been recognized beyond yes sir beyond this project yes sir uh, Ian Griffin who is a managing partner at uh, V3 magazine they actually put the book together which they did the, the art and uh, did the, you know the layout for mm -hmm. the actual face and hope magazine that was presented and um, he also you know runs V3 magazine which is a Northwest Georgia reader they put it out monthly and it just focuses on you know really cool stories and some businesses around here in Roma Floyd County and the surrounding areas he uh, saw the two stories that I wrote and gave me a call and uh, asked me if I wanted to come and write for him and uh, I jumped at that opportunity because I've been wanting to write for V3 for a very long time uh, I went to school with both Ian Griffin and Neil Howard we graduated from the same high school Neil Howard is the editor of the magazine and um, I went to work for them immediately and I've since uh, put some articles together and been in the past three or four issues so I'm really excited about that and I'm really learning a lot from Ian and learning a lot from Neil yeah. because they've done a, a fantastic job in putting the magazine together every month. Now, I have to say now V3 when I read them, there are some, it is a good, it's a good magazine. Yeah. I have to be honest. I mean, they have some good articles in there. Uh, I'm at to call Ian or somebody. I got to find a way to get more, more access to him. But I mean, the, I, I like the magazine. I'm not a big mm. magazine person because sometimes the writings can be so contrite, but right. it, it seems that they are able to capture the essence of the story itself, of the people they're talking about and the businesses. Right. And, uh, and some of them is, if done with some uh, some humor, and so yeah. some of the articles are very, you know, to me are very hilarious. But uh, I mean, it has to be wonderful to be able to do that for V three. It is, and one one thing they've really taught me to do is, especially with uh, journalistic reporting and and writing, is to remove yourself completely from the story. Mm. And Neil Howard, mm. you know, the editor explained it to me best. He said, "Be a canvas and let them just draw on you." And you can put it all together and make it pretty later, but let them just draw whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've tried to focus on when working with V3 is telling the story of the person that's talking to me. Mm -hmm. And they may not be the most interesting, a lively person, but it's my job as a writer to add that aspect into the article. Mm -hmm. And if it's a good story, it'll stand on its own. You know, but we, it's our job as writers just to add some of the, you know, the bells and whistles in the end to make people want to read. And it's also taught me a, a whole different form of writing, which mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of the AP style, which is a little bit different from, you know, MLA. And what you get is you get the best of both worlds. You get the academic world and the journalistic world. And it's not like a classroom situation. This is boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. We're doing this right now. <laughs> and I have been on a whirlwind crash course yeah. learning 
trip. I call it a trip because that's yeah. what it's been for the past. Well, three well let me months. ask you: um, Are deadlines beneficial for you, or, or are they problems that you tolerate? But do, or do they help you? I, I love a deadline. Yeah, I love a deadline because I've had them when I was writing in school. And of mm -hmm. course, we got times we have to have assignments in. Um, the deadline for the magazine is getting a little more strict now, whereas it wasn't before, but I find that it helps keep things moving, helps keep people accountable. And when, if you're going to write you know, for a major publication, I'm pretty sure that the, the qualifications of when you have your work in get higher, the bigger the magazine is. So this is something that you kind of have to get used to. It just comes you know, with the territory. Yeah. Whereas if you're writing a book or you're writing something for yourself, you can take four years if you want to, but other people are dependent on you to get these things in. So it's, I think it's a good thing to learn, to learn to deal with a deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know, um, I know you have been involved with the Boys and Girls Club too. Yes, sir. And, and we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that experience. Absolutely. That's going to be, and I don't want to give too much because mm -hmm. Mr. Eric Turner, who I, I know both yeah. of you guys know, <laughs> he's asked me to stay kind of hush-hush, tight-lipped about oh, it. Oh, really? But yes. Oh, really? But I'm going <laughs> to give you just a touch of, uh -huh. of what's coming down the pipeline from these guys. They're doing some, some really wonderful things with uh, the youth in the community at the Boys and Girls Club. They've recently won some awards for Triple Play, which I saw the, the show that you guys mm -hmm. did on them. Mm -hmm. But we did a project over the summer, and it kind of incorporated some writing and some mm -hmm. arts. And uh, he's going to want to, I think, come and speak about it when it's all wrapped up and done. But I, I must say that just like with Face and Hope, these kids actually got to stand in front of a mirror and look at who they really were and, and, f and face themselves and start to write about it and that was so therapeutic for them and to hear them say some of the things that you know they've been dying all their lives to say was really amazing and the form that it was put in is going to be something I think that people can enjoy for years to come. So it's on the way. And, now, and actually, this is all very mysterious. <laughs> yeah, we got to respect the process though. All right. you know, you know, we got to yeah. respect the process. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. It's, it's, yeah. it's dealing with music. Music and writing, and uh, but well, he he took it a step further, and he wants to submit it nationally to the Boys and Girls Club of America. So it's going to be well, something that's really. Well, I'm gonna cool. tell you right now, in my opinion, Eric Turner and the, and the programs that he work that he runs mm -hmm. are some of the best kept secrets in the Rome, Northwest Georgia. I yes, mean, sir. they have the Boys and Girls Club, and, and I know Eric the division. They have some tremendous programs that do some uh, great work. Yes, sir. Great work. Yes, sir. Well, we need to uh, take another quick break. We will be back, so stay with us after this. We'll be back. It was actually, I could tell you. and high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit boostup.org and take the first step. Welcome back to Community Watch and we've uh, had a conversation with Oliver Robbins <clears throat> about the Facing Hope Project, among other things. If you'd like a copy of this publication, um, even, even though I was not directly involved, I can, I can make that happen for you. Um, just email me at Georgia Highlands College, J Hershey, H-E-R-S-H-E-Y, at highlands.edu, and I'll uh, connect you with Ms. B. Uh, and we'll make sure you get uh, the copies that you want. So, and they're free. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an excellent, excellent read. Uh, Oliver, thank you. Hope you'll come back soon. Talk yes, to sir. Us some more. Whenever you want me, I'll come back. And thank you for being with us. We'll see you next time on Community Watch. Mm -hmm.